Vegas. I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, Trump on trial while the search is on to find impartial jurors. I don't like him. I don't approve of what he did as president, but uh, the right to a fair trial is extremely important. A dramatic day in a Manhattan courthouse after Donald Trump found himself seated across from prospective jurors for a second consecutive day, at one point being scolded by the judge overseeing the case for muttering at a potential juror, while the Manhattan DA filed a motion to hold the former president in contempt for his own social media posts, claiming he's attacking potential witnesses. Well, of all the details coming up. Plus... The U.S. Secretary of State is warning Israel's war cabinet not to bring about further escalation in their conflict with Iran, as the administration hopes Israel will exercise constraint following those hundreds of drone and missile attacks from Iran over the weekend. But with an Israeli retaliation still possible, did his message get through? And... It is not just the person who is preying on the child. It is also the co-workers who stand by and help these things go on. Our investigation into allegations of rampant sexual abuse inside L.A. County's probation department. No one to turn to who guards the guards. We speak to survivors who claim abuse at the hands of the probation officers who were supposed to rehabilitate them. Now thousands who say they were abused as kids in the system are seeking justice. I would love an apology from Los Angeles County Probation Department. I would like for them to admit that they failed us. Much more on that story in a little bit. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following two major stories tonight. Israel's war cabinet still weighing a response to that Iranian attack. But we do begin with day two of jury selection in Donald Trump's trial for allegedly falsifying business records to cover up payments to porn star Stormy Daniels during his 2016 campaign. Trump watched closely as potential jurors were questioned. And surprising progress today. Seven jurors have already been chosen and sworn in. Four men and three women. They're still looking for five more jurors and six alternates. After the day in court, Trump visited a bodega uptown to chance of four more years. And tonight, we're learning more about those seven jurors who are already seated. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off tonight from the courthouse. Donald Trump arriving today at the Manhattan courthouse, where for more than six hours he sat watching his lawyers and prosecutors grill potential jurors who could hold his fate in their hands. I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. At the end of the day, seven jurors were chosen. Three women, a teacher, a software employee at Disney, and an oncology nurse who said, I didn't know I was walking into this. And there are four men, the four person, a man born in Ireland who works in sales, two attorneys, and an IT consultant originally from Puerto Rico who called the former president fascinating and mysterious, saying he walks into a room and he sets people off one way or another. Throughout the day, the lawyers questioning the jury pool, looking to root out potential bias. The teacher who was chosen telling the court she's not a political person, but adding, Trump speaks his mind, and I'd rather that than someone who was in office who you don't know what they're thinking. Lawyers also scrutinizing social media accounts. Trump's attorney asking one man about a 2017 Facebook post where he wrote of Trump, get him out and lock him up. Judge Juan Marchand agreed to dismiss him from the case. Trump stayed mostly quiet, but at one point the judge chastised him for audibly muttering as a woman answered questions about what Trump's lawyer described as her extraordinarily hostile Facebook posts. One of those was a video of people dancing the day after the 2020 election, captioned, full-on dance party at 96th Street. Judge Marchand warned Trump's lawyer that Trump was muttering in the direction of the jurors, saying, I will not tolerate that. I will not have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. Trump is charged with falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 hush payment to porn star Stormy Daniels to conceal their alleged affair from voters before the 2016 election. That payment was made through Trump's former lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen. Trump denies the affair, and today he insisted all he did was pay Cohen's legal fees. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense. Some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was, and you get indicted over that? But prosecutors say Trump knew exactly what the money was for, to pay off the porn star and fool American voters. 
Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, five more jurors and six alternates still need to be chosen, but just refresh our memories how this works. The lawyers only have a certain number of prospective jurors they can reject outright without explanation, right? That's right, Lindsay. In fact, each side gets to cut up to 10 people from the jury pool for almost no reason at all. And Trump used that power today to eliminate four potential jurors. The district attorney's office here used it to eliminate five. The jurors who were seated, all seven of them, raised their hands. They were sworn in and told to report as soon as Monday back here to court. That means the judge thinks jury selection could be done by the end of the week. We might see opening statements here Monday morning, Lindsay. Well, could be faster than we expected. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. Former President Trump has complained that the trial will unfairly impact his ability to campaign. For more on this now, let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Uh, Rick, how active has Trump been on the campaign trail, and, and how will this trial affect his strategy? Not particularly active, Lindsay. In fact, there's been a lot of times where his only campaign events have been on weekends. Uh, there's also been times where he has uh, decided to attend court proceedings that were optional, voluntary for him, because it fits so well with his campaign messaging. And then he sent out a, a fundraising email saying he was forced into court, even though he didn't have to be there. This is different. He does have to be there. Every day the court is in session. Uh, he is finding some ways to, to, to wedge in campaign stops around it. Uh, he still has Wednesdays free for the most part. This court does not meet on Wednesdays and, of course, weekends and he's got another rally uh, planned this weekend. There's no doubt that it has an impact on his campaign schedule, but um, it, you know, we shouldn't let him leave the impression that he is out there five or seven days a week uh, hitting, hitting the stump when that just isn't the case. As we know, Trump likes to give hallway gaggles and press conferences right after court, uh, but do we expect the gag order he's under to, to kind of cramp his style? Well, I think if his lawyers have anything to say about it, it will cramp his style. They, they recognize that what he says out there is not particularly helpful, not just because of the gag orders uh, that, that could be violated here, and we've already heard about some potential violations, but also because things that he says might be contradicted by testimony inside the court, and it could be used as further evidence against him. Uh, he isn't necessarily going to listen to them. I expect that he's going to go and talk to the microphones whenever he wants to. He knows the media. He knows the way to, to kind of create new information and put it into the ecosystem when he wants, and he has that uh, very big megaphone waiting for him whenever he chooses to partake of it. And we know all too well what is bad news for other candidates tends to be Teflon for Trump. Still, is there a world that testimony from the likes of a Michael Cohen or, or Stormy Daniels harms Trump? Well, look, I, I think what they're going to be talking about is extremely tawdry, uh, kind of kind of repulsive on its face. Uh, they are flawed as individuals. One of them is, of course, uh, an adult film star. The other one is a convicted and admitted liar, admitting to the lo of lies to, to Congress uh, in court and, of course, to the public. Uh, so there's lots of ways to, to question uh, their credibility. One thing that Donald Trump isn't allowed or is supposed to be doing under the gag order is himself question their credibility. He's going to be testing the bounds of that, I think, pretty clearly in social media and maybe in public public appearances. Uh, but you're, you're right that uh, the, the, what, the, what these two individuals will have to say will be key to this case, uh, and whether they are credible as witnesses will be key to, in, in almost any world to, to, uh, to the jury in deciding whether or not to convict. Rick Klein, our thanks to you as always. Thanks, Lindsay. And tonight, after Iran's first ever direct assault on Israel, more than 300 missiles and drones over the weekend, tonight ABC News is learning more about a possible Israeli response and what the U.S. may be asking Israel to do. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports from the ground in Israel. Tonight, new images of Iran's first ever direct attack on Israel. Video from a village near Israel's Nebatim Air Base showing missiles raining down. Israel saying they only caused minor damage and vowing to respond. And tonight, a senior U.S. official telling ABC News that response is expected to be limited. And the Israelis have told the U.S. they will retaliate very carefully. We pressed the Israeli military today. Is it fair to say that some sort of response is coming? We will know how to do and when to do and what to do. Israel's war cabinet meeting behind closed doors for a third consecutive day, but no final decision over how and when to retaliate. At a base in southern Israel today, we were shown one of those Iranian missiles recovered from the Dead Sea. What you're looking at here is the back end of one of those Iranian missiles. Right around here would have been the engine. And this fuselage here is actually the fuel tank. It is over 38 feet long, made out of steel. And right around here would have been the warhead, capable of carrying 800 pounds of high explosives. Israel saying 99% of the more than 300 drones, missiles, and rockets launched late Saturday were shot out of the sky. 
But for roughly 15 minutes, Israeli and U.S. officials stunned by the scale of the attack, fearing the U.S.-led coalition and Israel's missile defense systems would not hold. Iran saying that attack was retaliation for the Israeli airstrike in Syria that killed top military commanders and making it clear it will respond quickly to any further action by Israel. All eyes remain on Israel. That's where we find our Matt Gutman. And Matt, we've learned the Israelis have told the U.S. they will respond. What are they telling U.S. officials specifically? That whatever their actions are, Lindsay, they will take them with care. They will exercise as much restraint as possible. But today, the Israeli military took us to see that bus-sized ballistic missile that Iran fired at Israel. Um, 800 pounds of a warhead easily capable of taking out an entire apartment building. One reason that Israeli officials, including the military, say that there has to be some sort of response to that unprecedented Iranian air attack. And analysts here are telling us that, you know, care means maybe something that's a covert kind of retaliation or something that has a light footprint. Lindsay. All right. Matt Gutman reporting in from Tel Aviv once again. Thanks so much, Matt. On Capitol Hill, there is growing pressure to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson as he prepares to introduce four separate foreign aid bills, including aid to Ukraine. ABC's Rachel Scott asked Speaker Johnson if he will step down. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion. And we are simply here trying to do our job. Rachel joins us now. Uh, Rachel, Speaker Johnson remaining defiant there. Uh, what's the reality he's facing with these bills, his party, and, and also the Democrats? Yeah, Lindsay, look, the reality is, is that House Speaker Mike Johnson is going to push forward with a move that could ultimately cost him his job. The Speaker of the House is taking that $95 billion bipartisan package that passed over in the Senate with additional aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and he's dividing it into four separate measures. That is now prompting calls for him to be ousted as Speaker. Congressman Thomas Massey joining Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. And, of course, Johnson knows that he is facing a razor-thin majority. If just one more Republican joins this effort, he could lose his speakership, and that would obviously plunge the House into chaos and uncertainty without a Speaker of the House yet again. And it could force Johnson to turn to Democrats not only to save his job, but also to push that aid for Israel and Ukraine across the finish line, Lindsay. Hard to believe we could potentially be back at square one again. Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill, our thanks to you. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is facing the possibility of a historic impeachment after articles against him were delivered to the Senate. Mayorkas would be the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in more than 120 years if the move passes the Senate. House Republicans voted to impeach him in mid-February over what they said was his failure to enforce border laws amid a surge in migrants arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border. The articles of impeachment have triggered trial proceedings in the Senate where lawmakers will be sworn in as jurors on Wednesday. Now to the severe weather threat for 40 million people, leading to a tornado threat for major cities like Kansas City, Chicago, and Cleveland. The storm system has already caused a dramatic funnel cloud in Nebraska. There have been nearly two dozen tornado reports across four states since yesterday, and lightning hit an American Airlines flight with a crew checking the tail after it returned to the airport. There's an enhanced threat for much of Iowa and parts of Missouri and Illinois moving into the Ohio Valley tomorrow. ABC's Rob Marciano is in Smithfield, Missouri for us, tracking it all. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay. We had a tornado here in Smithville a little after 10 o'clock or around a little after noon, I should say. You can see the damage behind me. A lot of wind coming in behind this tornado. The breadth of the number, number of tornadoes, as you pointed out, across four states is impressive. This is a very potent system with more tornado warnings happening right now. You see them on the radar pushing across the Mississippi River, going towards Davenport. Chicago's already in the rain. The tornado watches are up until at least 8 o'clock tonight. The system will continue to push off towards the north and east and kind of two waves. The leading edge pushes through Chicago in the next couple of hours, and then another one comes in behind that where the core of the low is, and that one will probably fire up some severe weather tomorrow. Detroit, back through Indianapolis, Cleveland, into Columbus. The threat for tornadoes will persist there till around this time tomorrow. This time tomorrow, rain into the New York City area. The past 24 hours here in the Midwest has been rough. Lindsay? And we can see that wind still kicking up there. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. The Supreme Court heard arguments today on a federal obstruction law that prosecutors have used to charge hundreds of January 6th Capitol rioters as well as Donald Trump. The law was originally passed to tackle business crimes. The justices are now questioning whether the government's use of it went too far. ABC's Devin Dwyer is at the Supreme Court. 
Tonight, justices at the Supreme Court appear divided over one of the key charges brought against January 6 protesters and against Donald Trump. The question whether the U.S. government can bring felony obstruction charges in relation to January 6th. The answer could imperil a key part of special counsel Jack Smith's election interference case against Trump and upend the prosecution of more than 350 participants in the Capitol attack, possibly leading to reduced sentences in some cases. At issue is whether a law enacted to prevent the destruction of evidence in financial crimes, carrying up to 20 years in prison, can be applied to those who disrupted certification of the 2020 presidential election. Joseph Fisher, a former police officer who breached the Capitol that day, brought the case, his attorney arguing the Justice Department has gone too far. Attempting to stop a vote count or something like that is a very different act than actually changing a document or altering a document. The court's conservative majority appeared sympathetic to the police officer's case. Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, uh, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? The court's liberal members focused on the plain text, which makes it a crime to obstruct, influence, or impede any official proceeding. There are ways, multiple ways, in which the drafters could have made it clear that they intended to also operate only in the sphere of evidence spoilation. But it doesn't do that. Really trying to dissect the intent of that federal law there. Devin Dwyer joins us now from the Supreme Court. Devin, if a majority of the justices side with that police officer, what could happen to some of the charges former President Trump is facing? Well, Trump's attorneys could move to have those charges of obstruction tossed out, Lindsay. Special counsel Jack Smith is pretty confident he can fight to have them reinstated, but they could potentially go away. Now, those are just two of the four federal charges against him in that case, so he could still be prosecuted. Uh, but that will depend on a much bigger question that the Supreme Court is taking up next week, and that is the question of presidential immunity. Is Donald Trump absolutely immune from any criminal prosecution at all? The justices will decide that question and the question we heard today in this case sometime in the next month or so. Lindsay. All right, Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. New details now on the murder indictment for an Ohio man who killed an Uber driver who he says he thought was trying to rob him. Now authorities believe they were both victims of a scam. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, Ohio authorities say both people in this video, the man with the gun and the woman, an Uber driver, were scammed last month with deadly consequences. 81-year-old William Brock charged in the murder of 61-year-old Uber driver Lolita Hall. Authorities say Brock had received calls from scammers telling him a relative had been arrested, demanding $12,000 for bail, telling him a driver would stop by to pick up a package with the money. Authorities believe the same scammers directed that Uber driver to pick up a package at Brock's home without telling her what they had told the homeowner. Hall had no idea what she was walking into when she arrived, Brock then confronting her at gunpoint. I was threatened that she was going to come and kill me. Hall frantic. Sir. Investigators say Brock took her cell phone and when she tried to get in her car to get to safety, Brock stopped her from leaving, shooting her three times, later calling 911. Well, I shot her in the leg the first time and I shot her in the shoulder. Hall later died. In a statement, Uber saying this is a horrific tragedy and banning the account of the individual who made the request. And Lindsay, authorities say they cannot stress enough law enforcement will never solicit cash. That should always be a red flag. Lindsay? Alex, thank you. The Food and Drug Administration has issued an urgent recall of a heart implant manufactured by Abbott that is used on patients with serious heart failure. More than 270 injuries have been reported related to the HeartMate 3 device with 14 reported deaths. Some 14,000 devices are affected by this recall, some dating back to 2008. It's used on patients waiting for a heart transplant or as a permanent implant when a transplant is not an option. It's also used for pediatric patients. Abbott has been actively contacting patients and doctors who've used this device. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The warning from pilots in an airline about what they say is a spike in safety and maintenance issues. But next, our investigation into allegations of rampant sexual abuse inside L.A. County's probation department 
In tonight's Prime Focus, we speak to survivors who claim abuse at the hands of the probation officers who were supposed to rehabilitate them. Now thousands say they were abused as kids. In the system, they are now seeking justice. The fact that he was able to retire a decorated person within the juvenile probation system as he preyed on me, it's, it's just ridiculous. It's sad, but it shows how broken the system is. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. When it matters most, America turns to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back, everyone. In Los Angeles County, officials predict they may pay out between $1.6 and $3 billion to resolve more than 2,500 claims of abuse. In some cases, this was sexual abuse inside the very facilities charged with protecting and rehabilitating the county's youth. Juvenile facilities run by the Los Angeles County Probation Department. The story you're about to see is the result of our months-long investigation into what's being described as a national disgrace and an outrageous open secret long ignored. We want to warn our viewers that this story contains accounts of sexual abuse that can be disturbing. Nestled at the base of this Santa Clarita, California canyon lies what looks like a summer camp. But aside from the name Camp Scott, the comparison ends there. When I got here, I was excited because I was told that I was going to find discipline, I was going to find rehabilitation. And so I was excited about that. But I found it, the things that I found here was the total opposite. This is my last chance. When she was 17, Renelle Hartley was in the MTV documentary Camp Scott Lockup, a rare look inside the facility. Camp Scott is now closed. 
It's just one of several juvenile detention facilities owned by the L.A. County Probation Department, which faces thousands of allegations of abuse, including rape and sexual abuse of children. Rennell was one of them. Everywhere I look, everything that I see, I just see his face. Mm. The face of her probation officer, Thomas Jackson. Rennell alleges in a lawsuit that he abused her more than two decades ago. He's one of multiple probation officers accused of trading privileges for sex acts with children in the county's care. He had me lift up my shirt to show him my breast. I begged him, I said, please don't make me do this. He said, you do have a review coming up. It's up to you how I write it. He had the pen, so he had the power. Another time, um, he made me grab his penis with my hand. Rennell and her former bunkmate, Akila Jefferson, are two litigants among the more than 2,500 now suing the county. Akila says in the lawsuit that Jackson, then the camp's acting director, would order her to his office when she was 16 years old. Some people touch me, people touch me, you know, cross me, show me different things. How did you feel in those moments? First, I was scared, but if I don't do it, what's gonna happen? Especially if somebody is basically like caressing your head and sending you to the direction where they want you to go, what do you do? Mm. You back here, you're a kid, you don't know. If you say, no, I don't wanna do this, you know? You just you do it. So you felt you could never say no? No, I couldn't say no. She wound up in probation after shoplifting clothes for her younger siblings. My granny didn't have no money to buy them, you know? So after a while, I started running with these girls, and it was like, oh, we could show you how to get clothes. My brothers needed clothes. I needed clothes. So I would do that. She then violated probation by missing school, and that's how she ended up at Camp Scott. L.A. County touts itself as the place for rehabilitation when you come here. Right. Do you see it that way? I don't. I see it as a place that broke a lot of children. Mm. Children who needed help, many of them from broken homes. A lot of these kids don't have families. A lot of these kids, mothers and fathers, are dealing with addiction, prostitution, jail, the criminal justice system themselves. They're runaways. They're ward of the court. So they know no one's coming to look they're for you. They're black and brown. Black and brown. Black and brown. Dominique Anderson first entered the L.A. County probation system after she says she poked a classmate with a pencil. When the police came, they said, you stabbed the girl with the pencil, and that's a deadly weapon, and it's a felony. Dominique was raised by her grandmother. Her dad was murdered when she was four, and she lost her mom to cancer. This is where she grew up, in the heart of Los Angeles. It brings back those good memories. Dominique was hopeful that the probation program might offer her new skills. The department says its mission is to rebuild the lives of troubled youth. Instead, she says she was groomed by three of the very officers who were supposed to protect her. This is the last place I was a kid. Here at the Crenshaw Probation Department, Ernest Walker was a supervisor. In her lawsuit, Dominique says that he picked her up from her grandmother's house, drove her to her hotel for sex, and then paid her $200. It was just, OK, well, I'm going to pay you $200. I'm going to pick you up. And he actually um, orgasmed on the ride to the hotel. How old were you when you first met Ernest Walker? 13. You were 13. Do you know roughly how old he was? I believe he would have to be like mid to late 40s. For her silence, she says in the lawsuit, Walker would routinely leave her money in a flower pot at this gas station. I remember him telling me things like, oh, I love that your breasts are just sprouting. He was mm. really interested in the fact that I was so young. Can you explain what you feel happened over the course of time with him? Was it rape? He was interested in me. He paid me for sex, and that's what I did. You're not old enough to consent. And that's the tough thing about being a victim. You never see it that this person is abusing their authority. You don't see it as them preying on you as being a child. You see it as 
This is the man of power. This is the man of affluence. This is an educated man. He's, a, he's not a probation officer, he's a supervisor. Dominique says after she reported being sexually abused by one of her probation officers, she was then approached by a female staff member asking her not to blow the whistle. She said he has a daughter, he has a career, he has a lot to lose. What did you lose? I think I lost my innocence, my self-esteem. There's a, a, a saying that, that loosely translated in English is, who will guard the guards? And I'm wondering if you feel that anybody was. No. And it's hard. It's hard when it's this pervasive, because everybody's dirty. You know what I mean? Who can you trust? It is not just the person who is preying on the child. It is also the co-workers who stand by and help these things go on. It brings up some hard memories, what happened while I was here. Mm -hmm. When Ronell tried to report her sexual abuser to the head of Camp Scott, she says her own traumatic past, that she was molested and forced into prostitution at 11 years old, was used against her. I reported it to the director, and she opened a file cabinet. And she opened my file, and she was like, well, Thomas, looking at your file, you can understand why I can't just take your word for it. It shattered me. And up next, we continue our investigation into sexual abuse inside L.A. County's juvenile detention system. And we hear directly from one woman who was formerly incarcerated and is now fighting to reform this institution from the inside out. The probation department or these facilities are responsible for putting programs in front of kids that are going to help them turn their lives around. And they are not doing that. That's where the true tragedy lies. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges against parents of the shooter at Oxford High School who killed four students and wounded others. There's a myth that the shooter just snaps. It's just not true. There are always signs he was crying for help and being ignored. He had pictures of a target on his bedroom wall, shell casings on his nightstand. A very toxic, turbulent relationship. Those people are yikes. The life they lived was just crazy. The sexting and the really terrible things they'd video of their sexual acts. They purchased that gun for him with his money and bragged about it. They're being told by a school counselor that he thinks their son's going to kill himself, and they do nothing. As soon as I heard they were called to the school that day, the messages about LOL, don't get caught, those were very, very concerning to me. That's the moment that no juror's gonna think, well, haven't we all been there? Here's what it is. I got it. They do not seem shocked about him having the gun. There was no shock. Zero. Zero. School shooters aren't created, they're made, and it's made over time. You don't get to walk away from that. You just don't. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate, it's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Tomorrow, a shark is here with real money advice for you. How can you fight back against inflation and make your dollars go further? Watch Good Morning America tomorrow. For so many years, the narrative around the royal family was completely celebratory, and suddenly they were at the center of upsetting stories. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Kate Middleton had not been seen in public for months. Something fishy is going on, and when it finally gets revealed, it is going to be huge. Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. A lot of people that have been filing awful stuff on the internet were shamed. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis regarding their future when it came to their popularity. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. 
The Crown in Crisis. This is Impact by Nightline. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? People say it'd be great if they all got back together. It's like saying, well, when will the Beatles reform? It's not going to happen. Now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I'm Aaron Katursky at the Trump Building on Wall Street. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Now back to our investigation into sexual abuse at L.A. County Juvenile Probation Facilities. Before the break, we heard from survivors Dominique Anderson, Rennell Hartley, and Akilah Jefferson. Now, Ashay Jackson tells her story. Once an incarcerated youth, she is now a member of the Probation Oversight Commission. She's trying to bring healing to a juvenile system that's accused of causing so much harm. Camp Scott is a place where problems can be turned into opportunities. Back in 1987, Camp Scott was the state's first military-style detention camp exclusively for girls, touted as a model for the country. Rennell and Akilah still can't forget the training that was drilled into them. Two, eight, eight seven, seven, zero, zero. 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 No, okay, okay, can you roll? roll. <laughs> if you want to see some marching, that's where you should go. Girls were told when they could eat, talk, and go to the bathroom. They showered in groups and were punished with solitary confinement. The goal was to scare the girls straight, but it was the probation department itself that soon got into trouble. In 2006, the Department of Justice began investigating LA's juvenile halls and camps. It revealed systemic abuse and unsafe conditions, and as a result, they were put under federal oversight for six years. An LA Times investigation in 2010 found at least 11 probation officers had been convicted of crimes or disciplined for inappropriate conduct with the youth in their care, including having sex with children in detention halls, beatings, and molestation. Investigative reporter Richard Winton broke the story. I named some people. It took him 13 to 15 months to get rid of those people, named in the LA Times as m committing multiple acts of sexual assault on multiple different females. There's been an unwillingness, it seems, to get rid of some people. I mean, they've known that there's been problems with people, and yet they stay on the payroll. Time and time again, federal and state investigations found abuse across the department's detention centers. There have been numerous occasions when outside bodies and oversight agencies have basically questioned how this place is run. And they've had numerous management changes, and yet they seem to be still stuck in the same pattern. The youth aren't protected. If we have folks in the room who'd like to make public comment, the Probation Oversight Commission was created in 2020 to reform and monitor the department in crisis. The deep, deep toxicity within the department. Eshe Jackson is a commissioner. She knows firsthand just how crucial these facilities are for young people who end up in the system. When I'm in there doing my inspections, it is me that I see. Because she was locked up in it herself. All they're trying to do is make it, and they're surrounded by all the wrong people, and they get no fair chances, and they get no forgiveness. The people in charge just didn't give a damn about the children that they were responsible for protecting. The law firm Manley Stewart and Finaldi was the first to bring a lawsuit against L.A. County after California opened a three-year look-back window for anyone reporting sexual abuse, and the floodgates opened. So many women have told us their stories of coming to camp with the hopes of rehabilitation, being groomed, and that turning into sexual abuse, rape, manipulation, control. Do you think that some of those accused probation officers are still working today? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've learned that recently the county has placed about 20 of them on leave. The county has known about this problem for over three decades. The lawsuits are now in discovery, but the county has estimated that it could cost up to $3 billion to settle cases with the thousands who say they were abused. That is staggering. 
It's an enormous amount of money, and this is taxpayer dollars. This is record-breaking. Guillermo Vieira Rosa is the new chief of probation. A former probation officer himself, he served in corrections for almost 30 years. He was sworn in a few months ago, the department's sixth leader in the last 12 years. This is a revolving jaw of leadership. There's no other way of putting it. L.A. County probation made it clear they would not comment on ongoing litigation, but the chief did agree to sit down for an interview, which the department then canceled twice, the second time after our crew arrived, citing the chief had COVID. Then, in a statement to ABC News Today, the Los Angeles County Probation Department said the vast majority of the lawsuits against the county predate the current probation and county leadership, noting they have, quote, repeatedly asked plaintiff's attorneys for the names of alleged defendants, as we want to ensure no alleged offenders have contact with youth in our care, and vowing we take all allegations of sexual misconduct seriously, investigate each one, and that such misconduct is absolutely deplorable, and we want to do our best to ensure that nothing like this happens. Yet the very day the department canceled our interview for the second time, the LA Times reported yet another probation officer was accused of having sex with an incarcerated minor and was arrested. Madam Chair, the motion carries. In February, the BSCC, a state oversight board, voted that the remaining juvenile facilities in L.A. are unsuitable for the kids and staff there. I don't see a way forward for L.A. County. They ordered them to close within 60 days unless probation could make numerous changes to make them safe. We just got a report that there were two more overdoses in the facility. The same issue is just persisting. If you still see the same problem and all you guys are talking about is needing more time, we've run out of time. Soon after the lawsuits were filed, the man Rennell and Aquila accused Thomas Jackson retired after 33 years with the department. Days later, Dominique's alleged abuser, Ernest Walker, retired too. We have depositions that are coming up for both of them. Well, they'll have to answer up to what they did, but they were both able to retire and as of now, collect a pension. We reached out to Walker and Jackson's attorney who declined to comment on their behalf. And in court filings, LA County, Jackson and Walker have denied all the allegations. When you hear that Walker was able to serve out his 33 years, resign just this past year. Right, the fact that he was able to retire a decorated person within the juvenile probation system as he preyed on me. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's sad, but it shows how broken the system is. This building once housed kids waiting for court. They do a lot of good things here for the youth. It's now a youth and community gathering space, but when Akila was 15, she was locked inside this now abandoned holding cell. That's where you wash your hands and drink water. Akila now works for Advocates for Peace and Urban Unity, trying to help kids from her neighborhood become successful. Here we do gang intervention, and we just added sexual abuse as well. If you need some shoes, you need some clothes, I want my organization to be able to provide that for you. You don't have to go out and do things or take this, even though you don't want to. I, I can remember him on top of me and I'm literally crying. And he's upset because I'm crying. Because that's messing with him getting off. And I don't want nobody else to experience that. What does justice look like for you? This. This is justice. So many girls came before us and it swept under the rug. Y'all shedding lights on it. A daughter of L.A., Rennell Hartley always loved the Santa Monica Pier. But she's moved far away from the pain she now associates with L.A. I would love an apology from Los Angeles County Probation Department. I would like for them to admit that they failed us. Dominique went on to study here at California State University, Dominguez Hills. She can only imagine how much better life could have been had she not been robbed of her childhood. I wish in them knowing that they're dealing with children who come from these trauma-based backgrounds, that someone would have pulled me to the side and said, young lady, you don't have to do that. 
You're a queen. You're worth more than that. Dominique Anderson. Now a mother of five, she's studying for her master's in marriage and family therapy. It's so crazy how trauma works because the people who inflict trauma, they're not worried that they preyed on you or they abused you. And they're not thinking about me, they went on with their lives. I'm still trying to fix myself and still blaming myself for what I went through. So it takes strength to be able to sit here and do this, but someone's gotta do it. We want to thank Dominique, Akila, and Rennell for sharing their stories. We'll be right back after this. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. Yeah, I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because you know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake in our world right now, more Americans turn here to David than anywhere else. And now, America's most trusted, most watched newscast, ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir, is available to you on YouTube. The new allegations about flight safety from a group of pilots, a college valedictorian is blocked from delivering a graduation speech, and what ABBA, Green Day, and the notorious B.I.G. now have in common. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. The American Airlines Pilots Union is sounding the alarm, citing a significant spike in safety and maintenance issues. The group says the airline is conducting fewer regular inspections on planes and has ended overnight maintenance checks unless a plane is specifically written up for attention and is running shorter test flights on planes returning from major maintenance. A spokesperson for that union saying that officials have spoken to senior management at the airline and were encouraged by the company's response. American Airlines telling ABC News that the company has industry leaders 
competing safety management programs that follow all FAA regulations, further bolstering its strong safety record. A series of gun bills sparked by the October mass shooting that killed 18 in Lewiston, Maine, appear headed toward final passage. The State House and Senate have now both approved bills that would require waiting periods on gun purchases as well as a bump stock ban. This after both chambers recently approved a bill that would strengthen the state's yellow flag law, boost background checks for private gun sales, and make it a crime to recklessly sell a firearm to a prohibited person. USC says the school's pro-Palestinian valedictorian will not be allowed to give a speech at next month's commencement. The school's decision reportedly came a week after a pro-Israel group accused Asna Tabassum of being anti-Semitic. Tabassum released a statement through the Council on American Islamic Relations, saying in part she was shocked by the decision and disappointed that USC was allegedly succumbing to a campaign of hate meant to silence her. USC said an intensity of feelings around the Middle East conflict had created substantial risks related to security and disruption of the ceremony and that tradition must give way to safety. NASA says an object that recently fell through a Florida home came straight from the International Space Station. The agency said in March 2021, ground controllers used the ISS's robotic arm to release a cargo pallet of old batteries after new ones were installed. NASA said the hardware was expected to fully burn up when it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere last month, but a piece survived, crashing into the home. The space agency said the space station would investigate how the object survived re-entry. The Library of Congress announced that it added 25 new recordings to its National Recording Registry, preserving them as important sounds of American history and culture. The notorious B.I.G.'s Ready to Die, The Chick's Wide Open Spaces, and Green Day's Dookie all made the cut, as well as works from ABBA, Blondie, and Juan Gabriel. The list also includes songs like Bobby McFerrin's Don't Worry, Be Happy and the classic Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. The Olympic flame for the upcoming Summer Games in Paris has begun its journey. The flame was lit in a traditional ceremony at the site of the ancient games in Olympia, Greece. What was not traditional was how it was lit. The flame is normally ignited with the help of the sun, but the weather forced organizers to use a backup flame this time. Now a group of relay torch bearers have started carrying the torch through Greece. The flame is expected to land in France in May with the opening ceremony on July 26th. Now to rust armor, Hannah Gutierrez is sentencing to 18 months in prison in the fatal onset shooting of Helena Hutchins. Her attorney is now speaking to ABC News. Malalangi has that story. The armor tasked with keeping weapons safe on the set of Rust, waking up behind bars for the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. The state has approached this prosecution um, from a standpoint of compassion for Ms. Gutierrez, for her age, for her lack of experience, my compassion came to an end. The judge handing down the maximum prison sentence to Hannah Gutierrez, 18 months, along with an emphatic admonishment. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. Ahead of learning her fate, Gutierrez addressing the Santa Fe courtroom for the very first time. My heart goes out to the film industry for the devastating pain that this tragedy caused. Begging for a chance at redemption. The jury has found me in part at fault for this god-awful tragedy. But that doesn't make me a monster. That makes me human. I'm the armor. Gutierrez's defense team tried to paint her as the scapegoat for producers, including Alec Baldwin, who was holding the revolver when it went off, fatally striking Hutchins and injuring director Joel Souza. Something that you guys had, had mentioned throughout the course of this trial is that she has been a scapegoat in this. Do you she feel was a scapegoat. The, the, um, you look at her role and what the other people's role was. You look at the producers. Several people talk about producers today and what they did and how the rushed environment they created, the safety problems. And then you look at throwing all of it on one person. Gutierrez's attorney speaking exclusively with ABC News. Mr. Baldwin might face a uh, sentence like Ms. Gutierrez did today, the full 18 months. So yeah, you'd have to be very nervous. You got very good attorneys, and I know they're working hard on it, but I think he's got to be nervous at this point. Our thanks to Mola for that. Now to the WNBA draft with the popularity of the women's game at an all-time high after March Madness. Last night was about the future of women's basketball, led by Caitlin Clark. ABC's Lara Spencer has the biggest moments. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. 
excitement hitting a fever pitch as basketball superstar Caitlin Clark officially launches her WNBA career. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade, and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs, but uh, more than anything, just trying to soak it in. The NCAA leading scorer and overall number one draft pick chosen by the Indiana Fever, basking in the moment with her family. I told my mom before this, is like, you know, I earned it, and that's why I'm so proud of it. Thousands of fans from her new team erupting in celebration. Her new teammates ready with Clark's jersey in hand. Clark, one of several superstars taking their talents to the WNBA this year. Cameron Brink, Stanford University. After an electric season, number two overall pick Cameron Brink heading to the Los Angeles Sparks. Her godparents are the parents of NBA superstar Steph Curry. The two have known each other since they were kids. So I actually FaceTimed Steph like five minutes before the, the show started. So he just said to, to just have fun with it. I think he can just share so much great advice. And Chi Town doubling up on star power. Camilla Cardosa. Angel Reese, LSU. Third pick, Camila Cardozo, and seventh pick, Angel Reese, former SEC rivals, now teammates for the Chicago Sky. I had a go to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I get to play with Camila. And for the first time in more than 25 years, Two Hawkeyes drafted in the same year. Clark's Iowa teammate Kate Martin, a surprise pick in the second round, heading to the Las Vegas Aces. I was here to support Caitlin. All I wanted was an opportunity, and I got it, so I'm really excited. Congratulations to all the ladies, and our thanks to Lara for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Next hour, the first. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The cops 
Now I'm my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. So you came in there and you, and you found him dead. You don't know how hard it was. Harvest baby lies. Why should keep it a secret for sure? But that told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. <laughs> You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes. The new 2020 True Crime Limited Series. Monday on ABC. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with day two of jury selection in Donald Trump's trial for allegedly falsifying business records to cover up payments to porn star Stormy Daniels during his 2016 campaign. Trump watched closely as potential jurors were questioned. And surprising progress today. Seven jurors have already been chosen and sworn in. Four men, three women. They're still looking for five more jurors and six alternates. After the day in court, Trump visited a bodega uptown to chance of four more years. And tonight we're learning more about those seven jurors who are already seated. ABC's senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off from the courthouse. Donald Trump arriving today at the Manhattan courthouse, where for more than six hours he sat watching his lawyers and prosecutors grill potential jurors who could hold his fate in their hands. I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. At the end of the day, seven jurors were chosen. Three women, a teacher, a software employee at Disney, and an oncology nurse who said, I didn't know I was walking into this. And there are four men, the four person, a man born in Ireland who works in sales, two attorneys, and an IT consultant originally from Puerto Rico who called the former president fascinating and mysterious, saying he walks into a room and he sets people off one way or another. Throughout the day, the lawyers questioning the jury pool, looking to root out potential bias. The teacher who was chosen telling the court she's not a political person, but adding, Trump speaks his mind, and I'd rather that than someone who was in office who you don't know what they're thinking. Lawyers also scrutinizing social media accounts. Trump's attorney asking one man about a 2017 Facebook post where he wrote of Trump, get him out and lock him up. Judge Juan Marchand agreed to dismiss him from the case. Trump stayed mostly quiet, but at one point the judge chastised him for audibly muttering as a woman answered questions about what Trump's lawyer described as her extraordinarily hostile Facebook posts. One of those was a video of people dancing the day after the 2020 election, captioned full-on dance party at 96th Street. Judge Rashawn warned Trump's lawyer that Trump was muttering in the direction of the jurors, saying, I will not tolerate that. I will not have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. Trump is charged with falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 hush payment to porn star Stormy Daniels to conceal their alleged affair from voters before the 2016 election. That payment was made through Trump's former lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen. Trump denies the affair, and today he insisted all he did was pay Cohen's legal fees. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was, and you get indicted over that? But prosecutors say Trump knew exactly what the money was for, to pay off the porn star and fool American voters. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. And tonight, after Iran's first-ever direct assault on Israel, more than 300 missiles and drones over the weekend. Tonight, what ABC News has learned about a potential Israeli response and the ask from the U.S. Secretary of State with Israel's war cabinet requesting a restraint in any potential retaliation. ABC's Matt Gutman is on the ground in Israel. Tonight, new images of Iran's first ever direct attack on Israel. Video from a village near Israel's Nevatim Air Base showing missiles raining down. Israel saying they only caused minor damage and vowing to respond. And tonight, a senior U.S. official telling ABC News that response is expected to be limited. And the Israelis have told the U.S. they will retaliate very carefully. We press the Israeli military today. Is it fair to say that some sort of response is coming? We will know how to do and when to do and what to do. Israel's war cabinet meeting behind closed doors for a third consecutive day, but no final decision over how and when to retaliate. At a base in southern Israel today, we were shown one of those Iranian missiles recovered from the Dead Sea. What you're looking at here is the back end of one of those Iranian missiles. Right around here would have been the engine. And this fuselage here is actually the fuel tank. It is over 38 feet long. 
made out of steel, and right around here would have been the warhead, capable of carrying 800 pounds of high explosives. Israel saying 99% of the more than 300 drones, missiles, and rockets launched late Saturday were shot out of the sky. But for roughly 15 minutes, Israeli and U.S. officials stunned by the scale of the attack, fearing the U.S.-led coalition and Israel's missile defense systems would not hold. Iran saying that attack was retaliation for the Israeli airstrike in Syria that killed top military commanders, and making it clear it will respond quickly to any further action by Israel. Our thanks to Matt Gutman. On Capitol Hill, there is growing pressure to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson as he prepares to introduce four separate foreign aid bills, including aid to Ukraine. ABC's Rachel Scott asked Speaker Johnson if he will step down. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion. And we are simply here trying to do our job. Rachel joins us now. Uh, Rachel, Speaker Johnson remaining defiant there. Uh, what's the reality he's facing with these bills, his party, and, and also the Democrats? Yeah, Lindsay, look, the reality is, is that House Speaker Mike Johnson is going to push forward with a move that could ultimately cost him his job. The Speaker of the House is taking that $95 billion bipartisan package that passed over in the Senate with additional aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and he's dividing it into four separate measures. That is now prompting calls for him to be ousted as Speaker. Congressman Thomas Massey joining Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. And, of course, Johnson knows that he is facing a razor-thin majority. If just one more Republican joins this effort, he could lose his speakership, and that would obviously plunge the House into chaos and uncertainty without a Speaker of the House yet again. And it could force Johnson to turn to Democrats not only to save his job, but also to push that aid for Israel and Ukraine across the finish line, Lindsay. Hard to believe we could potentially be back at square one again. Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill, our thanks to you. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is facing the possibility of a historic impeachment after articles against him were delivered to the Senate. Mayorkas would be the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in more than 120 years if the move passes the Senate. House Republicans voted to impeach him in mid-February over what they said was his failure to enforce border laws amid a surge in migrants arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border. The articles of impeachment have triggered trial proceedings in the Senate where lawmakers will be sworn in as jurors on Wednesday. Now to the severe weather threat for 40 million people leading to a tornado threat for major cities like Kansas City, Chicago, and Cleveland. The storm system has already caused a dramatic funnel cloud in Nebraska. There have been nearly two dozen tornado reports across four states since yesterday, and lightning hit an American Airlines flight with a crew checking the tail after it returned to the airport. There's an enhanced threat for much of Iowa and parts of Missouri and Illinois moving into the Ohio Valley tomorrow. ABC's Rob Marciano is in Smithfield, Missouri for us tracking it all. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay. We had a tornado here in Smithville a little after 10 o'clock or around a little after noon, I should say. You can see the damage behind me. A lot of wind coming in behind this tornado. The breadth of the number, number of tornadoes, as you pointed out, across four states is impressive. This is a very potent system with more tornado warnings happening right now. You see them on the radar pushing across the Mississippi River, going towards Davenport. Chicago's already in the rain. The tornado watches are up until at least 8 o'clock tonight. The system will continue to push off towards the north and east and kind of two waves. The leading edge pushes through Chicago in the next couple of hours, and then another one comes in behind that where the core of the low is, and that one will probably fire up some severe weather tomorrow. Detroit, back through Indianapolis, Cleveland, into Columbus. The threat for tornadoes will persist there till around this time tomorrow. This time tomorrow, rain into the New York City area. The past 24 hours here in the Midwest has been rough. Lindsay? And we can see that wind still kicking up there. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. The Supreme Court heard arguments today on a federal obstruction law that prosecutors have used to charge hundreds of January 6th Capitol rioters, as well as Donald Trump. The law was originally passed to tackle business crimes. The justices are now questioning whether the government's use of it went too far. ABC's Devin Dwyer is at the Supreme Court. Tonight, justices at the Supreme Court appear divided over one of the key charges brought against January 6th protesters and against Donald Trump. The question whether the U.S. government can bring felony obstruction charges in relation to January 6th. The answer could imperil a key part of special counsel Jack Smith's election interference case against Trump and upend the prosecution of more than 350 participants in the Capitol attack, possibly leading to reduced sentences in some cases. 
At issue is whether a law enacted to prevent the destruction of evidence in financial crimes, carrying up to 20 years in prison, can be applied to those who disrupted certification of the 2020 presidential election. Joseph Fisher, a former police officer who breached the Capitol that day, brought the case, his attorney arguing the Justice Department has gone too far. Attempting to stop a vote count or something like that is a very different act than actually changing a document or altering a document. The court's conservative majority appeared sympathetic to the police officer's case. Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, um, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? The court's liberal members focused on the plain text, which makes it a crime to obstruct, influence, or impede any official proceeding. There are ways, multiple ways, in which the drafters could have made it clear that they intended to also operate only in the sphere of evidence spoilation. But it doesn't do that. Our thanks to Devin Dwyer. New details now on the murder indictment for an Ohio man who killed an Uber driver he said he thought was trying to rob him. Now authorities believe they were both victims of a scam. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, Ohio authorities say both people in this video, the man with the gun and the woman, an Uber driver, were scammed last month with deadly consequences. 81-year-old William Brock charged in the murder of 61-year-old Uber driver Lolita Hall. Authorities say Brock had received calls from scammers telling him a relative had been arrested, demanding $12,000 for bail, telling him a driver would stop by to pick up a package with the money. Authorities believe the same scammers directed that Uber driver to pick up a package at Brock's home without telling her what they had told the homeowner. Hall had no idea what she was walking into when she arrived, Brock then confronting her at gunpoint. I was threatened that she was going to come and kill me. Hall frantic. Investigators say Brock took her cell phone, and when she tried to get in her car to get to safety, Brock stopped her from leaving, shooting her three times, later calling 911. Well, I shot her in the leg first time, and I shot her in the shoulder. Hall later died. In a statement, Uber saying this is a horrific tragedy and banning the account of the individual who made the request. Such a sad story. Our thanks to Alex Perez for that. Authorities in Oklahoma are revealing the disturbing details of what they believe happened to two Kansas mothers who disappeared while picking up the children of one of them. Our Maria Villarreal has this story. Tonight, police say two Kansas mothers who vanished on their way to pick up children for a birthday party more than two weeks ago were the victims of a chilling murder plot, all sparked by a bitter child custody battle. Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly were driving to Oklahoma to pick up Butler's children on their way to that party. Police say Kelly was there to supervise the court-ordered visitation, but their car found abandoned. This case was tragic. You have two people um, who, are, who are dead um, and four people that committed an, an, an absolutely brutal crime. Four suspects are now under arrest, including Tiffany Adams, the grandmother of Butler's children, who police say Butler was fighting for custody. According to court documents, the grandmother had bought stun guns and burner phones. One family member telling police on the day of the murders, the suspects blocked the road to divert the victims to a spot where the grandmother and others were waiting. The evidence that was discovered inside of that abandoned vehicle and around it um, were able to help our investigators determine that there was foul play involved. Such a horrific story. Maria joins us now. Uh, Maria, two bodies were found in the area where all of this happened. Do we have any new information on the case? Well, you know, Lindsay, Oklahoma authorities just confirmed to us that their coroner has been able to identify those two bodies as Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. And in fact, another family member, the one that was mentioned in those court documents, actually told investigators that these four suspects were part of a religious anti-government group. And authorities do believe they had been plotting this for weeks. Lindsay. Uh, Maria, our thanks to you. 
A new report by the Anti-Defamation League shows that anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. soared by a record 140 percent in 2023. The ADL reported more than 8,800 incidents of assault, harassment and vandalism against the Jewish community last year, the highest number of cases since the group began tracking data in 1979. These incidents spiked dramatically after the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. States with the highest number of reported cases were California, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. Still much more to get to tonight coming up. He started writing for big country music stars, and now he's out on his own. Ernest tells us the story behind the title of his latest album. But next, how the United States is paving the way for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to be extradited from London. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Reporting from the campaign trail here in South Carolina, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The United States has provided assurances requested by the High Court in London to pave the way for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to be extradited from Britain. That's according to a spokesperson for his wife. There will now be a court hearing on May 20th. His lawyers have already described U.S. assurances given in previous cases as not, quote, worth the paper they're written on. Reuters said there was no immediate comment from the U.S. Department of Justice or a court spokesperson. Unstable weather and heavy rain overtook parts of the United Arab Emirates, flooding some streets and stalling traffic in Dubai. The UAE's National Center of Meteorology said another wave of unstable weather was expected to begin from western areas and spread across scattered parts of the country. Chilean police rescued an elderly couple lost in a snowy mountain range in the Atacama region. According to officials, a heavy snowstorm blocking visibility and roads left the couple and their dogs lost until they were ultimately rescued after four days. Our next guest first made a name for himself by writing some of country music's biggest hits, working with everyone from Sam Hunt, Kane Brown, Chris Lane, and Jelly Roll. Now, with the release of his second album, Nashville, Tennessee, Ernest has cemented himself as a country music star in his own right. Let's take a listen to his new song, Kiss of Death. I see behind them eyes and girls. Award-winning singer-songwriter Ernest joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Appreciate you for having it. me. All right, so let's talk about this album. It's called Nashville, Tennessee, but it's about a lot more than just the city. It's really yes, personal for you. Give us a sense of the connection. 
Yeah, so being born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, I grew up around music. My family was not musical, but uh, I've always gravitated towards it. I picked up a banjo when I was in the third grade. Also got the Space Jam soundtrack for Christmas that year, and the rest was history. Um, I called the album Nashville, Tennessee because uh, I believe that the foundation of Nashville is the songwriters. And... Uh, this, this whole album is an ode to the songwriting community. In and, and you've said it there, you said third grade, but prior, you, you've talked about how you really realized your passion in elementary school. Yeah. When did you know, I have a, a knack for songwriting? Yeah, I think it was probably in middle school and high school well, when I was, you know, spending time in class writing poems and then going home and trying to figure out some chords to put it to. And I got, yeah, there, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Love to see those old home <laughs> videos. Look at you. <laughs> I didn't see those videos for a really long time. My video guy pulled them up and uh, got them developed. It's pretty wild to see. It's a talent show, high school talent show. It, what does your <laughs> songwriting process look like? It varies. A lot of the times uh, I'll hear somebody say something or I'll say a phrase that sounds like it could be a song title. Um, and then we'll go and get in a room, pick up a guitar, and I just kind of start spilling. Freestyling has kind of been my... Uh, I'd say my first instinct for writing a song, and then if we got to really go put our teeth in it, we can sit around and workshop. Is it different if you're writing a song for yourself versus for someone else? It definitely is now. Uh, when I first started, I was just trying to write the best song possible for years, just showing up every for day. For anyone. Writing songs, sure, trying to get cuts. And uh, with this record specifically, I've been a bit more selfish. I've been able to be selfish. I've, I've proven myself as a songwriter. I've gotten cuts. But in order to uh, really push the artist, my own artistry along, I need to be selfish and keep some songs. So now I can sit and intentionally write an earnest song. You've been open, uh, you've talked openly about having a heart attack when you were 19. Yeah. How did that impact you and, and also your career? I think, uh, you know, as a 19 year old, pretty healthy kid, baseball player, in the moment, it, it kind of was a breeze over. I couldn't wait to get back and play baseball. Mm -hmm. And the older I get, the more looking back at, you know, the, the different ways that could have gone, I just add that to a long list of moments in my life that there was obviously some divine intervention and I'm here for a reason and don't take life for granted. The Academy of Country Music Award nominations came out recently. You received two nods, New Male Artist of the Year and Artist Songwriter of the Year. How does it feel to get this recognition? Oh, it's incredible. It is new male artist. So I'm, I'm up there with um, some incredible names that I'm friends with in real life. And it was it was actually pretty shocking to get to get the noms this year. And I'm, I'm very thankful. What can we expect from you next? A lot of shows. I'm about to be out on the road playing. I'm going on tour with Brooks and Dunn. We're doing Stagecoach here next week. Um, and then I'm going to do a headline tour sometime at the end of the year. Get to play all these new songs off the record. And of course, you love Nashville. That's in your heart. But yes. but I see the Brooklyn Dodgers Brooklyn hat. Dodgers. You know, today is 77 year anniversary of Jackie Robinson's mm. debut at the Brooklyn Dodgers. It's a good day for baseball. What a pleasure to have you here, Ernest. You. And we want to let our viewers know you can listen to his new album, Nashville, Tennessee, out now. Awesome. And still to come, some incredible young women hitting the global stage in an attempt to show they got all the right moving parts. News. This is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. 911. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us to complete your Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series, Monday on ABC. They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? 
Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Finally tonight, meet the all-girl robotics team from North Carolina that will soon be putting their remarkable machine through the paces at a world championship competition this week in Houston. Reporter Anthony Wilson from our partner station WTVD has our local lowdown. Anderson connectors are just the greatest, aren't they? Yes, they're amazing. <laughs> the laughter and sisterhood of these very smart girls makes you want to learn more. They're members of G-Force Robotics, preparing for a world championship competition in Houston. That's where they'll face more teams of young STEM enthusiasts. Common goal, build a robot that can respond intelligently to remote commands. And I'm also doing the handoff in the middle so that the ring can actually shoot out. And in this group... There are 12 girls from 10 different schools in the area. Ages, they're all in high school, most are sophomore to senior. Robotics is a great outlet for those that are both interested in robotics directly and for those looking to build up leadership and marketing skills. They design, built, and control robots like the one they call Hellcat. Inspired by fighter jets, it's a name that honors one of their sponsors, Caterpillar. For some reason, they trust me to drive this thing. <laughs> Reckless driver, right? <laughs> Listen instead to a team member with years of experience. I originally started in First Lego League, which is the middle school to elementary school level. And from there, we moved up into the FRC level, which is First Robotics Competition. Ooh. Oh, I think you're over. I think you're over. Guided as they prepare for world competition by mentors. Oh, these are the these are the This is my eighth year um, in First Robotics. Uh, the science skills actually translate very well. The hands-on, the problem solving all applies. And it's something where not everybody becomes an engineer, but certainly helps in STEM. So with bright futures awaiting. I plan on going into game design. My plan B is going to the Naval Academy to hopefully become a pilot. But I do still want to keep up with robotics and hopefully do maybe battle bots in the future. Next up, the competition in Texas. We'll have an update next week. <laughs> No doubt some future phenoms there. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So what happens when being obsessed with pop culture collides with being a mom? You get us. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Right now, there's just so much happening in our